So indeed, they, they took us to this very fancy French restaurant in D.C., and uh, the, the, the things on the menu were in French, and uh, the waiter was French. It was very unusual to me, and of course, I was there, and I just said, is what I honestly said, I said, do you have any French fries? <laughs> well, of course, we have French fries. <laughs> uh, but I had some French fries and I learned that you can't order certain kinds of steaks well done there and all sorts of other things. Uh, so I, I, I hope next time we can go to, uh, you know, Burger King or, you know, Chick-fil-A or some fine eating establishment. You all have Chick-fil-A down here. That is a blessing. So that's why we host these things down here in Kentucky. <laughs> want to welcome uh, people who are watching online from the simulcast. We know that you are learning and worshiping and praying with us. And I also want to, uh, Isaac's been doing a great job, and so has Nissen. I also want to join Thabiti in rebuking Isaac. Uh, I was not trying to do the steering wheel down in the front. I mean, why would I try that? I mean, it's just, we've had a parade of Baptists so far, just dogging on Presbyterians, and you know, somebody has to tuck their shirt in, okay, around here? So I, I was, I, I understand that the only thing worse than standing completely still at a rap concert is to move when you shouldn't be moving at a rap concert. So, so I was not doing the top down, and I don't even know how Trip does it. Like, his, like this part bends, but not this part, and I don't know. So I was not, I, I had not stretched, and so I would not try that. The title of this message is Five Surprising Motivations for Mission. And we might as well dive right in, and I will tell you that the five surprising motivations I want to offer to you are the five points of Calvinism. Now, before I go any further, I need to address three types of people. First, those of you here or watching who do not like Calvinism. Just asking you to hang in there a few minutes. A little theology, a little bit of history, and we are going to spend most of this hour in the Bible so that you can examine for yourselves whether you think that these things are so. And in, in fact, we're going to spend most of the time looking at what Jesus said so you can conclude for yourself whether Jesus was a Calvinist before Calvin. So just hang with me, have an open mind. Second group of people, maybe the biggest group, you've, you've never heard of Calvinism. You're familiar somewhat with the cartoon strip, and that has been a blessing to you, but you hear people talking Calvinism and Arminianism, and in fact, you're going around and you're, you're mispronouncing it, and you're saying, oh, these Armenians, and there's people maybe from Armenia who are feeling really bad. What did I do? I can't help it. I'm from Armenia. No, this is Arminianism, and uh, you don't know anything about it, and uh, that's cool. That's okay. You'll learn a little bit. You don't have to have any background in any of these debates in order for God to use the Word this morning and this conference to motivate you for missions. There's a third group of people, perhaps not insignificant, and that would be those of you who are all about Calvinism. Thank, yes, and I am too, but let me tell you this. The message is not entitled, Five Surprising Motivations for Feeling Superior to People Who Are Not Calvinists. Okay, we got that? Uh, I was a college student once too, and I went through the cage stage of, of Calvinism and the sort of, you know, you just set up people and you have, you know, girls there and you're kind of in, and you flip to Romans 9, and who are you to talk back to God? Just giving you the Bible. Okay, I understand what that's like. What are the five points? They come historically from the canons of Dort, which was a council in the Dutch city of Dortrecht, or Dort for short. Uh, anybody here from Dort College? No. Oh, okay. Well, next time we'll get those folks from Iowa here. Uh, these, this synod, which is a church assembly, was responding to five points put together by some followers of Jacob Arminius, hence the name Arminians. 
Uh, the Remonstrants, they had their five points, and this was uh, started as an intramural debate among Calvinists, what is the, the true doctrine of the church? And so in response to these five points, the Synod of Dort issued its five canons or five heads of doctrine, which have become known as the five points of Calvinism. These five points were never meant to be a comprehensive summary of Reformed theology, let alone everything you need to know about the Bible. It was a particular controversy responding to particular points. The acronym that has been handed down, and it's uh, as best as we can figure, maybe just a hundred years old, is the acronym TULIP. T stands for total depravity. We are born into this world bad through and through, dead in sin, depraved in every part. That's the T. U, unconditional election. God chooses some for salvation, not based on foreseen faith, but according to God's own will, to the praise of His glory. That election, that choice on God's part is not conditioned by anything we do or He saw that we would do. L, limited atonement. The belief that Christ died effectively, particularly, and intentionally for the elect. Christ's death was sufficient for all, and it proved efficient for the elect. Now, almost everyone would agree with that, even Arminians. So, the, the missing component there that the, the Synod of Dort wanted to emphasize was the intentionality. Because people may say, well, certain, certainly it was sufficient for all. There was nothing limited in the, the ability of Christ's death. And unless we're universalists, yes, it was efficient only for those who are saved and, and uh, believe in Christ. But the canons wanted to also make the point that it was intentionally for those and only those whom Christ had purchased. I, irresistible grace, the belief that God sovereignly, supernaturally, and apart from human cooperation causes dead sinners to be born again. And P, the perseverance or the preservation of the saints, that God keeps His own unto the end so that those who are justified will unfailingly be glorified. Now, at first glance, as it was discussed in brief at the, the panel last night, it seems as if some of these points, in particular the point of election, would work as a demotivator for missions. And this was discussed on the panel. In fact, I was sitting in the front there with David Platt, and as they were talking about Romans 15, David says, oh boy, they're this is my whole closing message on Romans 15. I've got to scrap this thing. I thought, oh, it's okay. And then later they get into the five points of Calvinism. David, oh, there you go. They're just ruining both of our talks. <laughs> David hasn't been here. I think he's probably praying and fasting and you know, rewriting his message. But <laughs> you heard last night this logic, how this view of sovereignty and election can be for some a demotivator for missions. In our office, my, uh, my assistant, wonderful lady, she's very funny, she said, do you mind if I put up one of these demotivator posters? You know, not the motivational ones where it has, you know, everyone with the hands in and it says teamwork or somebody climbing a mountain and it says courage. So she has one with a picture of a, a ship sinking in the water and it says, mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. <laughs> that is a wonderful, just, you know, church togetherness piece in our office, demotivation in the workplace. And that's how many people view Reformed theology and missions. The logic goes like this. If God has already chosen those who will be saved, then why risk my neck to call people to faith and repentance, right? God's already going to do what He's going to do. If God is the decisive reason why some people believe and others do not, then God can take care of missions just fine without me. He's the decisive factor, then He can be the decisive agent. 
If God plans everything, including who gets saved and who does not, then what is the point in giving up my comfort to go tell people about Jesus when it's already be, been determined whether they will believe or not? Those are plausible sounding arguments. There is a certain logic to them. The problem is it is not biblical logic. It is not the way God reasons. And it's not what we've seen in church history. Uh, earlier this summer, one of the pastors at our church, Jason Halopoulos, wrote a, a, a nice blog on does Calvinism kill missions? And he argues, no, quite the contrary. The history of the church shows Calvinists at the forefront of this modern missionary enterprise. And he lists all sorts of people. John Calvin sent missionaries to Brazil and died as martyrs. John Eliot, who was a missionary sent to the native peoples in America in the 1600s, David Brainerd in the 1700s, leading evangelists in the Great Awakening, Theodore Frelinghuysen, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, William Tennant, William Carey, the father of the modern missions movement, a Calvinist who went to India, Robert Moffat to the interior of Africa, David Livingston in Africa, Robert Morrison, the first Protestant missionary to China, Peter Parker, not Spider-Man, a different guy, <laughs> uh, a physician and missionary to China, Adoniram Judson to Burma, Henry Martin to India and Persia, Samuel Zwamer, Samuel Zwamer, one of my favorites, known as the Apostle to Islam. His legacy includes efforts in Bahrain, Arabia, Egypt, a graduate of my alma mater, Hope College, grew up in a little Dutch town not far from where I grew up, Vriesland, Michigan. And from this little, uh, you know, just stop sign town, he became known as the apostle to Islam. Thomas Kidd, in an article, uh, he's a historian at Baylor, argues that Calvinists birthed the missions movement. So whatever logic you have, it is a historical fallacy to think that having this high view of God and His sovereignty would deter God's people from going. In fact, it spurs them and leads them there. Now, what I want to do with you in our time is to look at three passages from the Gospel of John. I know there are five points here, but old habits die hard, and so I couldn't even, I, I couldn't have a five-point sermon. It had to be a three-point sermon about five points. <laughs> so I want to look with you at three sections in the Gospel of John that hopefully as we look at Scripture together, you will see what Jesus saw and Jesus taught, namely, this glorious, necessary, risky, yet completely secure, beautiful, hopeful, and ultimately successful cause of global missions rests on the unerring, unalterable plan and purposes of God. We'll start in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Many of you are familiar with this story. Here you have Nicodemus, a Pharisee. He's a smart guy. He's a leader. He's a ruler of the Jews. He's as religious as they come, and he appears to be a fairly nice guy. 
maybe a little cowardly, but unlike other Pharisees, he, he's not overtly hostile to Jesus. In fact, he seems genuinely interested to be with Jesus, learn from Him. There's only one massive problem. He is not born again. He recognizes Jesus as a teacher come from God. He affirms Jesus has done miracles. He affirms He has power from on high, but that is not enough. And I should hasten to add that perhaps that may be the description for some of you. You're very pro-Jesus. And there's hardly anybody anti-Jesus in this country. In other countries, yes. Here, I mean, you talk to people, do you like Jesus? Well, sure. It's not to like about Jesus. He's like, a, you know, like a do-gooder in a bathrobe. He's great. I love him. You know, you, you, you never have people going, you know what I can't stand? I can't stand Jesus. No, like they can't stand the church, or they can't stand Christians, they can't stand who Jesus really is, but what they think He is. So they're pro-Jesus. You may be here, you're very pro-Jesus. I don't have anything against Jesus. I'm all about Him. I like Him. I know true things about Him. Yes, so did Nicodemus. And he was not a Christian. He was not saved because he was not born again. He must be born of water and spirit. Jesus tells him. And Nicodemus should have known, as a teacher of the law, he should have known that Jesus was likely referring to Ezekiel 36, the water as a sign of cleansing, the spirit as a sign of a new heart or a new birth, a new spirit. That's what the Bible means by regeneration, being born Again, Titus 3.5 calls it the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, just like the wind... The Greek word is pneuma. Just like the wind blows where it wishes, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The Greek word is the same there. Pneuma. God, this holy wind, God, this holy spirit must invade your heart, awaken you to the vileness of your sin, the truthfulness of God's word, the preciousness of Christ. He must do this work in you, and when He does this work in you, there will be some kind of change. I think it was A.W. Tozer who said once, it is plain horse sense. Oh, okay, he's got my attention because I don't want to you know, be against horses. It is plain horse sense, he said, that a profession that makes no difference in the person who professes Christ surely makes no difference to Christ either. Are you born again? There is no Christian life without the converting work of the Spirit because apart from this work, we're lost in sin, dead in trespasses, spiritually lifeless, unable, incapable, defiled, depraved. The language of total depravity does not mean that we are absolutely as bad as we possibly could be. Praise God for common grace that, you know, you meet people and they don't just, you know, push you over and take your wallet and trip you when they see you. They sometimes hold the door for you. They're kind, especially down south. They'll get you some sweet tea too. <laughs> Common grace. We're not as bad as we possibly can be. The total refers to the extent of the depravity. That it, it's not just our, our appetites or our, our base faculties and somehow our mind is untouched. No, it's, it's our will, it's our appetite, it's our affections, it's our intellect, it's our reason. Totality depraved. The Heidelberg Catechism says, are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined toward all evil? The Catechism says, yes, unless we are born again by the Spirit of God. Now, you think about that. If you really believe that, and this is what Jesus is teaching here, if you really believe that, we are inclined, we are bent towards evil apart from being born again. This is going to set you at odds with all sorts of people and all sorts of things. And we were watching a couple days ago a Christmas story, the George C. Scott version, just great, the Dickens tale. And uh, the thing I notice about so many of these stories, though, is the bad guy is just bad because he has a backstory. There's always something. So Scrooge gets the ghost of Christmas past and you, and you see what it was like and he, you know, his, his, his dad wasn't around or was too busy for him and then he had a, a relationship failure and breakdown. And, and the point is sort of, this is how Scrooge has become so Scrooge-ish because he's had bad things happen to him. And it's not to discount that uh, 
impact that others have on us. But it is to say this, your greatest danger in the world is your own heart. It's what's coming out of you. What, what can bubble from your heart, soul, and spirit if you are not born again? It's not just that some education or some parents or some, somebody did this to you. It's not just your backstory. It's a corrupt nature. We enter the world with inherited guilt and a propensity for sin. So as Thabiti was explaining, this is really important. Those who never hear of Christ are not condemned because they do not believe on Him about whom they've never heard. They are condemned because they are sinners. They are condemned, John says, uh, Jesus says in John 3, because the wrath of God rests on them. So yes, it's, it's because of the absence of faith that they are not saved, but God does not punish Simply because of that, He punishes because we're sinners, because we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So as you hear over these days so much about unreached peoples and unengaged peoples, realize that these important terms are, are just to highlight this biblical category of lost peoples. And when we say lost, we don't mean uh, you, you're going to go across the world and uh, we're going to impose... Western culture, we're going to just expect people to be backwards or need to put to death that sort of superiority. But we must revive this biblical category of lostness, not just sick, not just weak. There are not people out there that are just waiting for you to throw a life preserver and they'll grab on because they're struggling. We're not going out into the world just to help dead people look like they're alive. We have the impossible task of calling dead people to live. One of the movies when I was growing up, and I never saw it, and I, I, you shouldn't probably see it either, I don't know, but I just, this, the title was Weekend at Bernie's. The, 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 uh, the plot, so far as I can tell, was about two guys, and their, their boss dies, and in order to... Uh, avoid the mob or something, they have to pretend that he's alive. And so it's him in, you know, the Caribbean or, or Florida or someplace and going around and it's just them, you know, waving a hand with this dead guy, bringing him to parties and just the whole movie is sort of dark and macabre humor of pretending that this dead person is alive. Woe be unto us if that amounts to our mission strategy, to go out into the world and help dead people to pretend that they're living we have the impossible task, impossible in our own strength, of calling people to live though they are dead. And it's impossible for us, but it is entirely possible for God. First Peter 1 says, we are born again through the living and abiding Word of God. And Peter says, this Word is the good news that was preached to you. We cannot be saved apart from the work of the Spirit, and the work of the Spirit is never to be separated from the Word of God. The Word of God and the work of the Spirit are inextricably linked. And because of that, the work of the Spirit and the manifestation of Christ's glory are inextricably linked. Now, why is this important? It's important for this reason. John 16, 12 through 15, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says, the Spirit who comes will speak only what he hears. He will declare what he has been given. His mission is to glorify another. He is coming and has come to be a spotlight to shine this brilliant light upon Christ that people may see him, savor him, believe, and live. That's how the Spirit works. Which means that any notion of anonymous Christians is completely and utterly mistaken and fundamentally anti-Trinitarian. And what does that mean? Well, when I was in college, one of my professors who taught world religions, he's a very charming guy, very winsome, he's very liberal, and did a lot of damage. And I remember him saying, look, I am so much a Calvinist that I believe the Spirit of God blows wherever He wills. 
I'm more Calvinist than any of you. I'm so much of a Calvinist. The Spirit can blow. And if the Spirit wants to right now be regenerating uh, hearts in Islam and in Buddhism and um, Taoism and, and people that never know Christ, never hear of Christ, then God is sovereign, right? He can do that. So might there be people in other religions who don't know that they belong to Christ, and yet the Spirit has joined them to Christ, has saved them through Christ, even though they die and will never have heard of Christ. It's called inclusivism, and it's very popular. And many of you students, if you've never thought of it, this may be what you think, not because anyone's, you know, led you to that conclusion. You just think, well, that sounds good. And in fact, even the great C.S. Lewis, for all that we have learned from him, was very mistaken on this account. He says in mere Christianity, there are people who do not accept the full Christian doctrine about Christ, but are who, who are so strongly attracted by Him that they are His in a much deeper sense than they themselves understand. There are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it. And you see this come out at the end of the Chronicles of Narnia in the last battle. And oh, he seemed to be a worshiper of, of Tash, but no, he was really following Aslan. Now, here's why that cannot work. To talk about the Spirit's work in that way is to fundamentally misunderstand the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's work is always to reveal and glorify the Son. We cannot worship Christ apart from the work of the Spirit, and the Spirit does not want to be magnified except insofar as He points to Christ, which is why the symbolism of the early church was not the dove but was the cross. The Spirit works to throw a spotlight on the glory of Christ. The Spirit is not just working indiscriminately and sort of uh, secretly, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, but wow, you're born again and you don't know it, and you're saved through Christ, but you've never heard of Him, and I'm just going. That is not how the Spirit works. The Spirit longs to bring glory to a Christ that is known and revealed and seen and worshipped. The Spirit does not work apart from the revelation of Christ in view to cause sinners to be born again through the Word of God and a glorious vision of the crucified and risen Christ, which is why we must go and we must speak. Second passage, John chapter 6, beginning at verse 35. This is after the feeding of the 5,000 in this bread of life discourse, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that He has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about Him because He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know. How does he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And then go to verse 60. When many of His disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in Himself that His disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? 
Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. Sounds like complete and utter inability. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Do you see Jesus high? determinative view of divine sovereignty. You see it in verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me I will not cast out. Verse 44. No one, no one can come unless the Father who sent me draws him. Verse 65. This is why I told you, no one can come unless it is granted to him by the Father. Now, if this is new for you, just think now, and even as I'm talking, pray that God by His Spirit would teach you what His Word says. This may utterly change everything you think about God. Because we see here the Father has a people chosen for Christ and chosen in Christ. And we see that all of this number, all that He gives to Christ will come, and none will come except those who have been given and chosen in this number. And then don't miss this, no one who comes will be cast out. Here's what I've heard before, look, this is why I can't be a Calvinist, because you're telling me then that if, if my sister, my grandma, my best friend who's not a Christian, that if he comes to Christ, Christ may say to him, depart from me, for you are not elect. Blasphemous. It's not true. All who come are coming because God has drawn them. And so if you come in faith and repentance, you will not be turned away. The offer of the gospel is free and full, and because of God's electing and irresistible grace, it is possible. The logic is not to say, why come? Because you might not be chosen. Why call? Because you might not have the ability to do it. The Bible's logic and Jesus' logic is to say, come, because if you belong to God, you will. And call, because those who have been made able and have been chosen will come. It is our confidence in the electing love of God and the irresistible grace of our Savior that gives us any hope of success. You were dead. You and I were dead in sins and trespasses. And how were you saved? By the call of God. Your parents told you, a preacher told you, you read it in a book, you opened your Bible, and the Spirit moved through His Word to show you Christ and give you a new heart. You think God only does that in America? You think you came and you were just sort of, you know, well, you know, I kind of, I'm just sort of half dead. No, this isn't like the princess bride. There's no mostly dead, okay? It was all dead. You think the miracle that God did for you in your heart is restricted to people that look like you, people that have your background? You don't think He can do that other places? Of course, there are... There are obstacles and there are generational issues and there are cultural issues that make it difficult, but a dead person's a dead person and it's a miracle to raise any of them and God can do it. What hope do you have? Why would you go unless God can do it? In John 5, Jesus says that He, he will come and on the last day He will call forth the dead from their tombs, some to everlasting uh, life and some to everlasting death. He calls them and they come. 
irresistibly. And so as I've heard it said before, it is a good thing that Jesus in John chapter 11 prefaced his comments with the word Lazarus, because if he had just said, let the dead come forth, all of the tombs would have been emptied. Such is the power of his word. You say, why go share the gospel if God has just chosen some? And everything in the Bible says to you just the opposite. Why would you go unless God has chosen some? John Newton, the hymn writer, slave trader turned pastor, once said, if I were not a Calvinist, I think I should have no more hope of success in preaching to men than in preaching to horses and cows. As many as were appointed for eternal life believed. That wasn't written by John Calvin. That's Acts 13, 48. And that's why we go. God is the only one who can make light shine in our darkness. He's the only one who can give new life to the dead. He's the only one who can justify. He's the only one who can quicken the heart. The only one to renew the mind. Unless the Father draws, no one can come. We are born again, not by blood or by the will of the flesh or by the will of man, but of God. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Belief in an electing, sovereign, all-powerful God does not discourage us from missions and evangelism. It is the only thing that gives us freedom and hope in missions and evangelism. You don't have to be putting on the hard sell. Yeah, you, uh, you wouldn't be interested in Jesus, would you? And uh, let me tell you, I mean, if that's what you think of missions and evangelism and you're just the ShamWow guy, and now for a limited time offer, come to Jesus now with 50% more blessing. And you're just sort of trying to trick people, trying to sell people. You don't have to be afraid. You can be humble when you see results and hopeful when you see nothing at all. The doctrine of election gives us assurance that God will save, and the doctrine of irresistible grace gives us confidence that He can save. We will not go, we will not send, we will not suffer without a firm conviction that our God is mighty to save, and He will not lose any of those appointed for eternal life. So Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And then you go four verses later, Zechariah 4.10, do not despise the day of small things. It's only if you have a God like that that you can say that. Zechariah 4 is talking about the building of the temple, and he says, when you hold the plumb line, the, uh, like a, a level, I, I gather, that's my, my sort of carpentry, like hammers, nails, I just learned about levels, so that's the sort of thing that he's, he's holding up. The, the wall is built, the corners are squared. He said, oh, you will see it. It looks small, it looks insignificant, it's nothing but rubble. We have decades ahead of us, but you will see when I square off the final corner of the temple that you were wrong to despise the day of small things. And you and I will be wrong if we despise the days and years and lives of small things. There's a book called The Barbarian Conversion from Paganism to Christianity. It's about the evangelization of, of Europe, which took the better part of a millennium. And the point that's emphasized over and over is this, quote, the conversion and Christianization of the countryside was a very slow business. And the author, it's not a Christian book per se, I don't know if he is a Christian, he's a scholar. He argues that three things won the day, the demonstration of power, the faithfulness of preaching, and the utter unwavering persistence. This conference is not just about making senders or goers, but also stayers, stayers, people who will go and will last 
And if you are to go and to last, you must rest in the providence of God. You know the story in Acts chapter 18, Paul wants to leave Corinth and he gets a dream and the Lord says to him in a vision, do not be afraid, go on speaking, do not be silent for I am with you, no one will attack you to harm you for I have many in this city who are my people. You may say, well, that was nice, Paul got a vision and it was about Corinth, it's not about where I'm at, where I'm going. But it is in a way. Everything God promised to Paul, He promises to you. His presence, I am with you. His protection, not a hair can fall from your head apart from God willing it to be so. Not just bare permission, willing it to be so. And He promises you His providential oversight of the Word of God. That the Word will not return empty. And He has promised to every missionary and everyone who will go and labor. He has promised that there will be some from every tribe and tongue and language and nation who will believe. So when you go and you labor among the unreached peoples and you labor for years with little or no visible fruit, you remember this promise that there are some among this people who are appointed for eternal life. That's how you can stay. That's how you can go. God's sovereignty is our best fuel for ministry faithfulness. I mentioned Samuel Zwamer, the apostle to Islam, probably saw less than a dozen converts in his 40 years as a missionary. Now, in this conference, you, you need to get from the one side the, the peril and the plight that God uses that to motivate people to go. There's a plight for the lost. There's peril. You, you, you need to get that. You need to, you need to grasp what the need is. And that may get you there. But in addition to peril and plight, you need a lot of promises if you're going to stay, if you're going to last. What will sustain you if you go and you realize this is much less glamorous than I thought, much less exciting. It's much more mundane. It's much like living real life except harder and less convenient and farther from my family. Election gives you confidence in the sufficiency of the Word of God to do the work of God. And I want to just bring you to one more passage. John chapter 10. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have a life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And then verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus tells us this good news here that he is the good shepherd. Uh, just because it's interesting, uh, I looked in the uh, Latin translation, the Vulgate, and in the Latin, Jesus says, I am the pastor bonus. This is Latin for good shepherd, sumum bonum, the, the good, the, the pastor, the good shepherd. Jesus is your, you got a pastor. You want to follow that pastor, you want to listen to that pastor. You got a bonus pastor. <laughs> He's a good shepherd. He's the best shepherd. He, he, he knows the sheep. He cares for the sheep. 
He, he didn't get a, a, a career in messiahship because carpentry was difficult. Okay, Jesus is the good shepherd. That's his identity. He's not just trying to make a living. He's not a hired hand. He's the shepherd. He lays down his life. I read a story one time about a family in the Florida Everglades. The family was in the backyard playing, and the husband and wife saw an alligator come out of the bush. I'm from Michigan. We have snow, but as far as I can tell, in Florida, you just got alligators just like the right away on the streets. They're just everywhere. True story. The alligator came out of the bush, grabbed their small child, headed back into the bush toward the water. The husband, looking around for a weapon. He's a good husband. He's figuring, here we are. We've got to be a gun. Somebody's got something here. Or he's looking around. And while he's looking for a weapon to go attack this alligator, the mother, without thinking launches into a dead sprint, jumps on the alligator, kicks it, hits it, bites it, screams at it until the alligator lets the child go, goes back into the water, the child goes free, she faints. <laughs> she was no hired hand. She's even a little bit better than dad on that day. <laughs> she was a mom. And if a mom does that, a mama bear for her baby cubs. What does the good shepherd do for his sheep? He lays down his life. And Jesus is not for the wolves, not for the goats, for the sheep, for the ones who know his name, the ones he knows by the name, the one who when he calls, hear his voice and respond. Jesus died for the sheep, sometimes called limited atonement. Limited is not the best term. It makes it sound like we have some interest in narrowing the atonement. What we mean is that there is a particular redemption, a definite atonement, and it is a motivation for us in missions because it is better news for bigger glory when you have a definite atonement. Jesus did not die indiscriminately for everyone in the sense that He died as a substitute in their place. If you mean, as John said last night, he died for everyone such that whoever will come can be saved. That is true. But here we see more careful exegesis tells us that the good shepherd died for his sheep. That's why John 6, Jesus says he came to save those the Father had given to him. Why Matthew 1.21 says, you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And John 15, 13 says he lays down his life for his friends. And Acts 20, 28 says he died for the church. And Ephesians 5, 25 says he gave his life for the bride. The atonement is limited in the sense that the redemption is particular. That God from eternity past set his affections upon you to be his treasured possession in a way that is utterly unique? Do you fully grasp what it means that God loves you in Christ? I saw a t-shirt one time that said, smile, Jesus loves you, and then it said, but then again, he loves everybody. We kind of think, well, yeah, Jesus loves me. I mean, but that's just what Jesus does. He just loves people, and God just, he's got to love everybody, and I'm part of everybody, and so he loves me. Do you know the specificity, the uniqueness, the particularity of His electing love for you, whereby Christ died not just to make a way for you to be saved, but died in your place that you would be saved. Spurgeon said, we are often told that we limit the atonement of Christ because we say that Christ has not made a satisfaction for all men, or all men would be saved. But Spurgeon goes on to argue that it's the view of the atonement which says that no one in particular was saved at the cross that actually limits Christ's death. Spurgeon says, we say Christ so died that He infallibly secured the salvation of a multitude that no one can number, who through Christ's death not only may be saved, but are saved, must be saved, and cannot by any possibility run the hazard of being anything but saved. That's the better news and the bigger glory. 
if the atonement is not particularly and only for the sheep, then either we have universalism, okay, Christ died in everyone's place, therefore everyone has had their sins forgiven and the wrath of God assuaged, or we have something less than the full substitutionary atonement of Christ, because then we must no longer mean that Christ died in my place as an elect sinner who will come to faith, but rather He died for everyone so that He made a way that we might be saved. Do you see the difference? Did Jesus die to remove the final obstacle for our salvation, or did He die so that in His death we would have salvation? Here's what J.I. Packer said. It cannot be overemphasized that we have not seen the full meaning of the cross till we have seen it as the center of the gospel, flanked on the one hand by total inability and unconditional election, and on the other by irresistible grace and final preservation. For the full meaning of the cross only appears when the atonement is defined in terms of these four truths. Christ died to save a certain company of helpless sinners upon whom God has set His free saving love. Christ's death ensured the calling and keeping of all whose sins He bore. That is what Calvary means and what it meant. The cross saved, the cross saves. And I belabor this point not to make you all card-carrying Calvinists, though I could find some cards if you're interested. I don't say it to belittle Arminian brothers or sisters, many of whom have labored long and hard for the cause of the gospel. But to give Jesus Christ His full glory, not merely as one who says to you, I have done my part, I laid down my life, I love everyone so much, would you now come to me? As if for Christ were standing there hat in hand just begging for people, just pleading that, that someone would accept Him. Or as the old, uh, you know, centuries old evangelistic tract would say, it had, you know, election ballot, and it had Jesus voting for heaven and the dev devil voting for hell, then it said, you must break the tie. That is not the gospel. With this doctrine, we can go and we can tell people that in Christ, through faith, he not only made a way for you to be saved, but He saved you to the uttermost. The one who says, I was pierced for your transgressions, I was crushed for your iniquities. I have purchased with my blood, purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. I myself bore your sins in my body on the tree so that you might infallibly die to sins and assuredly live for righteousness. For my wounds did not merely make healing available, they healed you. And of course, with all of this theology in place, how can we have anything but the perseverance or the preservation of the saints? John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. I give it to them presently, enjoying this eternal life here on earth and looking forward to the eternal life to come. Now, this is no cheap believism. This is no kind of decisionistic Christianity. Just raise your hand, just come forward, just sign a card, and then go live like the devil and it doesn't matter. But we see from Jesus, true, regenerate, born again, grace-filled disciples cannot ultimately fall away. Isn't this good news? Isn't this a reason to go? You hear all about the, the global geopolitical picture and there's security issues. There's food security. We need to help people grow crops and help them store things. That's important. It's good. There's water security. Uh, there's civil unrest and there's political national security. No matter how wise you are, no matter how talented your group of volunteers, no matter how accomplished your NGO or your humanitarian organization, you will not be able to give any of those things with ultimate security, but you can go and you can promise in the name of Jesus eternal 
security. That there is one and only one who can save you, who can keep you, who can promise to you that through him and in him you will never perish. And so you can risk. You can risk everything because God risks nothing. You can be surprised because God will not be surprised. You can give up some security because you have all the security you could ever need. The purpose of all of this theology is not just to know it, but to go, to believe, to proclaim, and to live forever. That's what you're sharing about Jesus. I had the privilege this past year of doing a funeral for an older woman in our church, an African-American woman. We're mostly white church, and it was a privilege that her family asked me to do the funeral and do the message, a little funeral chapel at the funeral home. I never felt like I was preaching so good in my life. I was just getting all sorts of responses and thought, where's my congregation been all these years? She was a sweet lady. Her family was from Philly. And uh, your family get up and say, you know, we're all from Philly. And I mean, they're just legit Philly. And then say, but Lansing, Michigan's all right. (laughs) It's a lot if you're coming from Philly. And she would shake my hand after the end of the service. She always said the same thing. Pastor, have a Jesus week. (laughs) And she would often say this to me before I'd preach. She'd say, Pastor, why don't you put in a good word for Jesus? You going to put in a good word for Jesus this morning? <laughs> in a way, that's all he asks you to do. You don't have to know how to win friends and influence people and be the salesman of the year. Can you put in a good word for Jesus? This Jesus? Just, put, just putting a pebble in somebody's shoe. You know, you get that little pebble in your shoe and you're... You know, it's just a little teeny pebble, and you're trying not to think about it, but you just, yeah, all day, and you're, you're talking to someone, you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, <clears throat> and I'm pretty, pretty soon you're ready to, you know, start doing stuff, and you're, you know, and you just get this little shoe, that, that, that's, that's what you're doing, this little pebble, and you don't know in your lifetime what you may do and all the people that you've caused to walk with a little limp, a little Jesus that you gave them, they can't, they can't quite shake, and trying to figure out who this Jesus is and what he's about. And you may not have seen anything, but you put in a good word for Jesus. If you are going to risk everything to tell others about Jesus, you need to know who this Jesus is. You need to know what he accomplished. You need to know for whom he died. You need to know what sort of promise you have that if you go and if you do this with your life and if your parents don't understand and if your friends don't like it, that somebody at some point will give a rip about anything you say. Only with a sovereign God. This glorious big God theology tells us not only what to say about Christ, it gives us the profoundest motivation to go out there and to say it. For if these things are not true, why risk your life for a message that is not necessary, a plan that is not fixed? a cross that does not save, a grace that cannot conquer, and a promise that may not hold. But oh, oh, this rich, deep, high, robust, glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with all of its particularity and all of its angles and all of its doctrinal comprehensiveness, this message is worth dying for. The peoples of the earth need it, and those whom God has chosen and for whom Christ savingly died will irresistibly believe it, receive it, and live forever. And that's why we send, and that's why we go, and that's why when you get there, you can stay. Let's pray. Father in heaven, these are weighty things and they are glorious things and they are above and beyond us. 
beyond this poor preacher's power to tell. But when all of these poor lisping, stammering tongues lie silent in the grave, we will still have a nobler, sweeter song. And we will give you all our praise. Would you so work by your divine spirit to blow through this place and in our hearts to know whom we have believed and that he is able, more than able, to accomplish all that he, that you, Lord, have appointed. You have called us to it, and you are faithful, and you will do it. In Jesus' name, amen.